Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 15. This is on the cell membrane. Uh, one of my favorite demonstrations to do for people who don't know a lot about biology is to extract the DNA from a banana. It's really simple. Uh, if you were to Google it, you could find a, a, a quick recipe for taking a DNA out of a banana. Um, the first step, though, is to add shampoo to it. Um, and that's confusing to people. Um, but if you have an understanding of the DNA where it's found, and then how a cell is organized, uh, it shouldn't be that confusing. So the DNA sits here in the inside of a nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. It's surrounded by a cell membrane. We call that the nuclear membrane. And then the cell itself is surrounded by um, another cell membrane. Now, if it's a plant cell, it's going to be a cell wall around the outside, but on the inside of a DNA, it's pretty mushy, and you can get through that really quickly with just a blender. Um, so if you add soap to that, what does that do? Well, the soap is going to dissolve the membrane. It's going to dissolve the nuclear membrane, and it's going to release the DNA, which you can eventually add to alcohol and get it to come out of solution. Now, why is a, a membrane really easily dissolved by uh, soap? It's because it's made of lipids. It's made up of fat. So it tells you a little bit of, about the structure um, of cell membranes. And so in this video, I'm going to talk about selective permeability. What does that mean? It's that cells only allow certain things in and certain things out, and it can regulate what gets in and what gets out. Um, of, a, of a cell. And it does that using the cell membrane. Now our understanding of cell membrane is what's called the fluid mosaic model and I'll talk more specifically about that in just a second. Now there are a few things, uh, cholesterol, glycoproteins, and glycolipids that are found uh, within the cell membrane that are important. But the majority of the important things in a cell membrane are the phospholipids, those are going to be the fats, uh, and then the proteins. Uh, and so the phospholipids are amphipathic, that means they have a part that likes water and a part that hates water, or they have dual nature. Um, and what they do is they allow small and uncharged particles to move through it. And pr proteins uh, are going to be found within the membrane. What they mostly do is regulate transport, what can get through and what can't. Uh, and they allow things that are bigger and charged to actually get through. And so selective permeability in all cells is, is formed through the cell membrane, and all living things have cell membranes. Now, not all living things have uh, cell walls. That gives them more structure, and so I'll show you a picture of a, a plant cell and the cell wall in that. Um, also pictures of bacterial and fungal cell walls, but animals don't have cell walls. We just have that cell membrane around the outside. Okay, so let's start with the parts of the cell membrane. Again, I said that the cell membrane is uh, our understanding of it is that it's a fluid mosaic model. Let's first start with the mosaic. What, what does mosaic mean? It's made up of a number of different things. And if you look at this, the first time you actually look at a picture of a cell membrane or a diagram of it, you should be blown away by how complex it actually is. It's made up of a number of different things. And it's also fluid. What that means is that all of these things are moving. And so these things uh, are called phospholipids. These are those fats. And so they will actually migrate. They'll float around. And so all of these things are in flux. If we were to have a movie of it, all of these things would be floating, the proteins would be floating, everything would be floating, and so it would be moving. And if it's not floating, if it's not fluid, then material can't actually get through. So that's the fluid mosaic model. It's made up of a bunch of different things, and then it's, uh, it also is constantly in, in flux or in, in movement. Um, there's a few things on here that I would like to point out before I actually talk just about phospholipids and, and the proteins. And those would be, um, let's start with cholesterol, see if I could find cholesterol. Here's cholesterol molecule right here. Cholesterol molecule, we like to, most people think cholesterol is bad, but it actually has a huge role inside our, um, our membranes. What it does, it'll actually connect phospholipids together. And so what that does is it keeps the phospholipids from drifting apart too quickly. And so when you get hot or when the temperature increases, our cell membranes would start to fall apart if it weren't for cholesterol kind of grabbing those phospholipids and holding them together. The other role that cholesterol does, it actually keeps them apart so they can't get too close. So as the cell membrane gets too cold, cholesterol keeps those things apart. So cholesterol actually has a really important role inside the uh, cell membrane. Another thing here, we've got a glycoprotein. Glycoprotein is made up of two things, protein, which is going to be inside the membrane, and then this glyco means sugar, so it's going to have these strings of sugars on the outside. Glycoproteins, uh, probably the most famous one that you're familiar with are what are called um, antibodies. Antibodies, which are important in the immune response, are actually a form of uh, glycoprotein. And then another thing would be glycolipids. Let's see if I can find a glycolipid. 
oh, here it is, glycolipid right here. Glycolipid is going to be uh, fat, but it's also going to have sugars attached on the outside. And glycolipids are important when we have signaling. So if I have a molecule that's coming in and it's going to attach to this, and maybe I want to take some of that molecule in, they're going to be um, a, a, a attachment, almost like a key in a lock, between that molecule and the glycolipid. And so th there's a number of different things, things on a, a cell membrane. I'll talk more about those later uh, when we talk about cells. But right now I want to talk about two, phospholipids and then, and then proteins. So phospholipid, lipids are one of those major macromolecules that we have uh, in all living things. But what's interesting about a phospholipid is it has two parts to it. Okay, phospholipids are uh, fats. And so like any fat, most of the phospholipid is actually made up of carbon and hydrogen, or a, it's a hydrocarbon. And so uh, that's half of the phospholipid. But what makes it different from other lipids is that it has a head that has a charge to it. In other words, the head has a charge, and that has a result of the phosphate group that it has on the inside. So this is charge, and then there's no charge on the inside. Or another way to think about that is this head is going to be polar, and the tail is going to be nonpolar. So what does that mean? All of the heads will line up next to each other. All the polar parts of the phospholipids will line up. And so the surface of a cell membrane is going to have a charge. And then on the inside, there's going to be no charge. And all the tails will face the inside. Well, things like water, which is polar, is going to be on the outside of the cell and on the inside of the cell. And it's going to be attracted to that membrane. Uh, but it's not going to be able to move through the middle. And the reason why is that there's no charge. Or it's nonpolar on the inside. So as a result of phospholipids, um, we get certain things that, are come, that can easily come across and certain things that can't. And so let me talk about two things that can easily come across. If it's really, really small as a particle, then you can sometimes just scoot across. And if you have no charge, you can move across as well. You can move uh, through this kind of no zone, no fly zone here. And so an example would be carbon dioxide and oxygen. So carbon, and carbon dioxide and oxygen can freely move back and forth. And the reason why is that they have no charge and they're also really small. And so example, when you breathe in oxygen, how does that oxygen eventually get into the cell itself where we need it for cellular respiration? Well, it's just going to move through diffusion. And it can move easily across that membrane because it's very small and it has no charge. Likewise, when I breathe out, I breathe out carbon dioxide. How does that move? Well, it moves easily across because it's no, it, there's no charge. And so if it were just phospholipids that made up uh, membranes, then we'd be out of luck because we couldn't move things that are large or things that have any amount of charge. And that's where proteins come in. Proteins, there's a number of different proteins. This would be a channel protein, and so it goes all the way across. We'll sometimes have like peripheral proteins. So proteins come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes. But what they essentially do is allow big things and things that have a charge to move across. And so this process I'll talk about in the next podcast. It's called facilitated diffusion. But what you can do with a protein is you can actually move molecules across. So right here we're moving glucose, it looks like, across, or a sugar. And here we're moving some particles through facilitated diffusion. So these these are things that maybe are too large or have a charge and couldn't move through this no-fly zone. Uh, one thing we used to think about was H2O and how does water move across the membrane? Well, it's small, but it has a charge. It's polar, so it can't really move across this middle. And so what scientists discovered was something called an aquaporin or a a protein that allows water to move through it and actually can control the amount of water that moves through. So actually water's moving through a tight little uh, bind in this aquaporin. And then we can also use proteins to actually do active transport. So this is the famous sodium potassium pump. And what it's doing is it's caching in ATP to move sodium to the outside and then potassium to the inside of a cell. Um, and so proteins are important because they allow big things and things with charge to actually make it across the membrane. So those are cell membranes, but other, other organisms are actually going to have one other layer outside of that, and that's called the cell wall. Now the cell wall gives them additional perme uh, selection of what gets in and what doesn't, and it also gives them rigidity. Um, so for example, in a plant, a plant is going to have a membrane, that's this yellow portion, but it's going to also have a cell wall around the outside. If we actually look at what that cell wall is made up of, most of the durable part of the cell wall is actually cellulose. And that's why it's hard to eat a tree, for example. Um, but what that cell wall gives them is structural integrity. And so water, as water flows into a plant, 
Uh, if it was a human cell, uh, it would actually explode or lyse the cell, but as a result of this cell wall, it can actually hold that water uh, in. Uh, bacteria have a cell wall as well. And so bacteria have a cell membrane on the inside, but they have a cell wall outside of that. And some of them will have a capsule on the outside of that. But this cell wall gives them protection as well. It's also what we usually attack in, when we formulate antibiotics. It's what's actually killing the bacteria. Now their uh, cell wall is made up of a different chemical. It's not cellulose, but it serves the same purpose. It's something called peptidoglycan that mostly makes up the durability. And then this is a fungal cell. So a fungus will have a, uh, fungi have a uh, cell wall as well, but it's actually made up of another chemical called chitin. And so cell wall just adds to the protection that some cells have. But again, animal cells don't have that. Uh, and so um, that's cell membranes, that's cell walls, selective permeability, and I hope that's helpful.